Right, welcome to our 2023 Distinguished Lecturer in Computer Science. Um, these um, are lectures that we have here at Churchill College for the computer science community here and indeed worldwide. Um, we have got more than one audience tonight. In addition to the audiences of students and alumni here in the hall or in the rooms on Zoom, we've also got my security engineering class and we also have the security group uh, because the topic of our talk tonight crosses the boundary between security and dependability in interesting ways. Site reliability engineering is about how you keep your websites up despite all the things that bad luck and bad people can throw at you. And we're delighted to have as our speaker a distinguished alumnus of the college. Adam Twist came up as a computer scientist in 1993 and stayed with us until 1996. And um, he started a company in his college room that went on to become a significant player and has since then done all sorts of interesting things in industry around website reliability. And most recently, he's been looking after the reliability of Google's websites um, in Europe and Middle East and Africa, which is an enormous responsibility. So um, over to you, Adam. Tell us how you do it. Thank you, Earth. Uh, it is so wonderful to be back in college. I don't think I've been back here since about 98. I don't think I've worn a suit since about, oh, I mean, 10 years or something. So um, it is full of very many happy memories. Um, so I was, as Ross said, I was a Churchill student. I was here in the 90s. And what I, in the 30 years or so since then, I've been doing various things in terms of making and breaking the, the internet. Um, during this point in time, I've set up several different companies, some of which that have been moderately successful, um, some of which, most of which are actually still trading today in one form or another. Um, I'm going to share with you some of the stories of this, because it was not all plain sailing, particularly in the early days. And I'm going to hope to try and entertain you a little bit, inspire some of you, particularly some of the younger members of the audience here, share some of the, the learnings as part of that. And if I fail with all of that, don't worry, because dinner and wine is only about an hour away. So I need to set some context. This is a photo I found. Actually, there's one or two people in the room today who are actually in this photo with me, maybe three or four. Um, this was back here in Churchill, 93 to 96. And some of you, like you know, Frank King was still the, 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 uh, was very much here, and other people here in this, you know, have maybe not changed. But the world was quite different then. So for the benefit of the younger members of the audience, I need to actually just help to take you back in time. Like, some of the older ones will go, of course there was no mobile phones in those days, but for the students here, so just, just, just bear with this slide. Right? Mobile phones did technically exist. They weren't smartphones, and as a student, you certainly didn't own one. Wi-Fi didn't really exist at all until 97, and was not available to consumers until 99. Um, uh, Internet was typically this thing, kind of this thing that box you put into your phone line that made various squawking noises and gave you about 50 kilobits a second if you were lucky and had a clean phone line. And it wasn't like Google or other things these existed. The internet as we know it, like Google, didn't come along until September 2000, so until, until 1998. But this was actually a really pivotal time. I was just joking with Andrew earlier a little bit about this. This was a time of great change, the really early points of the, the internet as we know it. So, uh, you know, Andrew, Chris, Julie, Juliet, this way, uh, and other people in the audience here, we came to Cambridge um, in October of 93. A few months beforehand, the first web browsers as we know, and technically speaking, Tim Berners-Lee may have claimed he invented the internet a little bit beforehand, but there was no graphics and there was no software and it didn't run on typical machines. And Mosaic was really the turning point, the birth of the modern web as we know it. Does anybody know what the top right picture is? Go on, Chris. There's a stack of floppy disks. It is, it is. This is how you installed Linux at the time. You, you actually didn't. Before, when I first installed Linux on my machine, I had to run to the computer lab uh, with a whole bunch of floppy disks, download the 30 disks of Slackware, and then install it onto my machine. Linux was just being born. Version 0.99 was actually out a few minutes beforehand. And I think it was a little bit later that by March of 94, version 1 of Linux came out. Does anyone know the connector at the bottom is there? Yeah, yeah, okay, oh, good. There were people here who actually you know, remember that actually when in, in, Ethernet was a physical thing and it wasn't a turn based T connection. 
Um, you know, Churchill was pioneering. By the time we were first year students, we actually had a 10 megabit a second symmetrical internet connection. It was just totally unheard of. It was 20 times faster than, uh, not 20 times faster, 200 times faster or, than, than anything really many of us have actually seen anywhere else. And the bottom right screenshot here is Doom had just been released. It's kind of the first multiplayer, first person shooter map ever. And I did have to maybe spend a little bit of my first year or to second year playing, playing Doom along the way. So this was the kind of point in time when, when we came up to Cambridge. We were like kids in a candy factory. We messed around with all of this new technology. We got into writing some multiplayer games, learned to use Linux. And at the time, Linux was not really easy to use. I still remember when trying to actually install Linux for the first time, I couldn't do it all. And there was some problem with my, the drivers or something. And I was emailing backwards and forwards with Linux Torch files who taught me to compile my, taught, taught, taught me to compile my first ever Linux kernel. And we set up our own websites and did stuff. And during the, the second year, Damien Reeves, who was my partner in crime a lot of this, we, we set up a website. It got quite popular. And we got to this position, right? We, 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 had, we couldn't sleep at night. Our machines at that point in time were 486 DX266s with 16 megabytes, not gigabytes, megabytes of RAM. And they couldn't really cope with that much. And the fans and the hard disks in those days were noisy. We had three choices. The first one would be to shut down our site. The second one would be to buy more hardware that we couldn't afford. Or we had to write better software. There's only one choice here that any self-respecting software engineer would ever take. So after our exams, we didn't put it off until we finished our year, our second year exams. We had 11 days left to, before we kind of went down at the end of term. And we set out to go and actually try and write some, some better software that would actually be able to cope with more than the small amount of load that our, our site was generating. And I've got a few lessons and takeaways from, from my journey here. And the first one is, it's really important to understand the pain that you're trying to solve. And if you can't sleep because of something, it's often good motivation. So there I found Wonders of the Internet. This is a post that Damien, my, my uh, co-founder, made in 15th of June, 1995. And before the days of Twitter, the way you kind of communicated with the larger people was something called uh, uh, Usenet. Um, and here is the posting that started lots of things off. And we actually had the names used here. I didn't think we had the names used here, but it was there actually in this thing. And we were looking for some beta testers to try some of this out. And we had a few people from around the world, uh, wonders of the early internet, come along and try this out. And, it, and at this point, it was not necessarily clear as to whether anything would have happened about this at all. Um, but we, what we did here was something really wise. We got our product into the hands of some early users. And I think serendipity plays a really important part in my own stories and adventures and in many other people's. And like, I think actually, you know, I'm going to talk about a chance encounter that I think without which my first business would probably not have happened. So there was a girl who lived beneath me on staircase 38 at Churchill. And she had a boyfriend who uh, um, was met someone at a barbecue who was doing some cool web stuff. They were a very early web design company. And they got talking about this. And, and, and Richard, this guy, said to him, look, you must meet these people and introduce us to this company. Um, and so we spent that summer. I spent that summer as an internship at Madge Networks. Um, and at the end of that, I went down and uh, spent a few weeks down with this web design company in London. It was a bit of a crazy environment. We had nowhere to stay down in London, so we kind of stepped in the office. There was one sofa. And Damien and I took like one night each and just coded through the night the other night. Uh, this web design company in the early days, kind of part web design company, part design agency, was an eye opener for my uh, more protected, narrow little mind. Crazy party scene, fashion suits for Levi's in the office coming in. It was uh, an eye opener in many ways, but it was also an eye opener in terms of, hey, there's actually big brands are starting to use the internet. And there's actually a good business opportunity potentially here, seeing the way that this was going to be used and embraced. But I wanted to actually share a story about this slide. And I've almost forgotten about this until I wrote the slides for this. Is I remember the, the, the thinking back to this web company, a, a conversation I had quite well, where they wanted to try and actually create in their basement, the ground floor of where they were, uh, an internet cafe. Now, again, for younger people, when you didn't have a, an internet connection on your phone or a computer to get to the internet, people used to go to inter cafes and actually use computers that were there. I've got a little photo of one in Edinburgh from the early ones. At this point in time, there's one internet cafe called Siberia in London. I think that was about it. 
But we thought about this, actually, well, how can people actually use an internet? Like, as students at the time, we would log on through Pine, Telnet into Hermes, and uh, read our email. But you can't really do that for the average user. And we, we ended up actually coming up with the concept of a web-based email system that the uh, people could actually use. And this was a full year before Hotmail was launched, then sold 18 months later to, to Microsoft. And so looking back at this, I don't want to just kind of have this selection bias to tell you the things that we did that were really smart. There's also a few things about things that were big opportunities that we maybe missed along the way. But at this point, things were starting to happen. So as we kind of over this summer, as well as seeing the big brands starting to adopt the internet, um, a company called Netscape went public in the summer of 1995. And this was a pivotal moment that probably was the birth of the internet age. And I kind of give you, like, again, I'm trying to bring back some uh, snapshots of various kind of newspapers at the time. Mark Andreessen, you probably know him as the venture capitalist uh, behind Andreessen Horowitz and many, many businesses now. Uh, this was his first company. He was on the front page of Time here. And looking back, many historians kind of feel that this was the moment that the, the kind of internet began, or the internet business began. And then we almost had this thought, I remember Damon and I at least having a, a chat or two over, maybe it's semi lightheartedly thinking, you know, do we just drop out of university and, and do this? And actually we decided that actually internet connections in the real world were far slower, that the student bar here at Churchill was far cheaper, and that a Cambridge degree would be a, a useful plan B, and hey, we only had a year left anyway. So back we came to our, our third year at Churchill here. We were, at this year, um, we were um, balancing our finals, enjoying student life, uh, and also trying to develop a business. We were also pioneers in online learning, which is otherwise known as not necessarily attending many lectures in person. But I would point out many of the universities had really good online resources, and it was uh, uh, managed to come out of it with a decent grade in the end anyway. Uh, and my final year project in Damien's, we were building uh, interesting stuff in terms of web browsers or web proxies or other stuff here that was somewhat related to what we're doing. And I have many fun stories in this one, because Andrew, uh, one of my fellow, who's another Churchillian in, in my year, uh, uh, this story actually involves a party in his student bedroom. Uh, you think about what this was now, Andrew, I'll look at the face here. Um, this was a year, I know, I know it very well. So what had happened is Sun Microsystems, who were the biggest server vendor of enterprise systems of those days, had put on its website some benchmarks of our software, about, and they were trying to sell our servers, and they said, a new range of servers targeting the web marketplace. And they gave two benchmarks. They gave their benchmark using Netscape software. Again, Mark Andreessen, front page of Time Magazine, uh, darling of, of, of the Wall Street software, and our software on, on their systems. And ours was the, this graph that was three times higher. And this was the first time we had real validation from big people that we were three times smart. We might be not as rich as the people who made all this money, but we you know kind of came with students and you was taking great satisfaction from being our software being so much better. And I remember this because we saw this just before we went around to this Eurovision Song Contest party where there were some drinking games based upon which um, country you got assigned. And it was a little bit hazy in my memories here. But I remember telling somebody that night about the fact that how we'd done this and someone saying our software was so much better and someone not believing me. So we wandered back to a computer, looked at the website, and there on Sun's website was a chart, and it still said R1, but the Netscape chart had moved. And I'm like reloading the page, thinking this can't be right. And you know, and you're just thinking, was I dreaming this? Was this like this? Turned out I wasn't dreaming. The next day, I actually got again okay, jumping slide here, a guy called Steve Kershaw talk about who was the Larry Page of his day, who had actually seen the page and actually saved a copy from his webcast. So I do actually have a had a copy of it. And what had happened, and I found out later in the day after this, is somebody at the weekend in Netscape had lent on someone very high up at Sun, and they'd changed their website because of us. And we were just two students messing around at this point in our student bedrooms. And actually, we were actually, you know, the ripples of what we're doing were being felt elsewhere. And we felt cheated. We felt a little bit like, but actually, there was also a sense of, sense of satisfaction, a sense of actually, hey, we actually are maybe doing something significant. So during that final year, we put a, a price on our software on our website. We didn't really know. We'd never done any marketing or, or really knew how to start a big business, but we had a website. We put a price on it. And one day, I came back from lectures. It's rare because I 
didn't make it to that many lectures in my third year. But I came back from lectures, and somebody sent an email. And it says, hey, I would like to buy a copy of your, uh, buy a license for your software. Um, can you fax me through a pro forma invoice so I can send you a, a purchase order? And my first thoughts were, wow, that's a thousand pounds, and that's a thousand pounds in 96. That's a lot of beer tokens. My second thought was, what's a pro forma invoice? And my third one is, where am I going to get a fax machine from? Again, for younger people, a fax machine is kind of how you sent documents about. Um, do I go to the Churchill College fax machine and have Churchill College on the fax headers? Probably not. So we decided then to go down to Dixon's and max out our student credit cards, fax machine, Microsoft Word, invoice wizard, create an invoice, uh, uh, fax it off to them. And lo and behold, uh, four or five weeks later, we actually got a check back. A few weeks later, um, we were dealing with, um, this is before the days of Google. Remember, Google didn't come to 98. Uh, before Google, I mean, there were a few search engines. There was AltaVista, there was others. But the kind of dominant one for a while was a one called InfoSeek. The founder of this was a guy called Steve Kirsch, who was also the inventor of uh, not the mouse, but a particular type of mouse and various other things. And he was a CEO. And he was, at this point, just working on the second version of InfoSeek called UltraSeek. And he wanted to use our software to do this. And he, so literally, our second customer was the CEO of the biggest search engine of the day. And he wanted four licenses. And that was a lot more beer tokens. And sure enough, a check came in from him in dollars a little bit later. And we, kind of, we just kind of sat them on our desk for a while, quite literally, because it was like, you know, job application forms, checks. And if this pile got big enough, we could ignore this pile over here. Eventually, though, we actually decided there was enough of a pile on the right-hand side of checks that had come in that we could do this, and we actually we should actually probably put these in a bank account at some point. And there's a picture of punting here, because I remember we got distracted, I think, on the way into town, bumped into some people, ended up going punting. Uh, it, was, it was a summer. It probably looked a little bit like this. Carnage on the river, a few glasses of pims. Came back, walked into the Barclays Bank in wet shorts, T-shirt. Hi, we'd like to open a business bank account, please. Are you sure? Yeah, like some doubtful looks a little bit. Um, but we then kind of showed them, yeah, and we got these checks we wanted to deposit, and they were like moderately big checks in a range of different currencies. And they went, ah, OK, I can't deal with it. We need to speak to somebody else. And eventually, they took us seriously enough, and we kind of, this was the beginning of our business. And the kind of lesson from this is, and I had a teeny bit of poetic license there, but it was pretty much as this happened. And there's a few people here who can call me out if not. But like, it was pretty scrappy. It was pretty fun. And that's often the way that startups are, particularly when you're doing it on a shoestring budget. So we graduated. Uh, we had enough money to think about not, doing, uh, not applying for jobs for a little bit. But it was far from, from easy. Uh, we lived in the back bedroom of a friend, the same friend, actually, as a site who introduced me to the, the, the web design agency living and sleeping in his back bedroom for a few months, and then in, went to move to my parents' house. We moved to Silicon Valley for a little bit, thinking actually the world was more advanced there. It was actually really difficult to kind of go from that student phase into uh, creating a proper startup business. There just wasn't the startup infrastructure in any way, shape, or form that there is today. At the same time, you kind of got your parents in one ear saying, why don't you get a proper job? You've got friends who've gone off and got proper jobs. Um, and we were very naive. We didn't necessarily know what we were doing. We were kind of making it all up as, uh, as we went along. And I think one thing that really carried us through this is the kind of both the partnership and the camaraderie that Damien and I had. And any startup business that I've had, and I've done a few now, it is that founding team is so important. You know, so many, very few startups ever survive with a single founder because you need other people to take you through it. But we kept going to those early hard times, we kept growing. I found some of my company's house accounts a while ago and put some numbers in here. So we actually made, by the time, we, this, this our financial year ended June. So by the time we basically graduated, we made about 15,000 uh, pounds. And there's small beginnings, but we tripled it to 45,000 and 110 and 330. And by, by the 2000, we got it to about 1.3 million pounds. So it's like exponential growth from, from low beginnings. Um, one of the things that shaped Zeus uh, was that we had some early investors. And it was another chance encounter. A company called Autonomy that you may have heard of, been in the news a little bit uh, in recent years, uh, went public in 1998. 
Um, we were in the same building at St. John's Innovation Center, um, owned by St. John's College, as the name suggests. Um, and uh, you know, for, for these kind of investment bankers to make it out of the city and come up to Cambridge, they like think, well, who else can we meet when we're there? And this company, uh, kind of uh, looking for autonomy's business for the IPO, came up and decided to knock on our door, pretty much. And they kind of like took one look around our kind of slightly chaotic office. At this point, we were only about three or four people. Um, and they kind of saw us and they thought, no, we are a bit too small to make a, for them to make 6% of an institutional private placement farm. And they kind of maybe, that kind of moment where they kind of looked around and maybe looked for the door. But we were the nimble, fast uh, uh, entrepreneurs and they were the, the fat cat investors. So we got to the door first, shut, shut it behind them a little bit and sat them down and explained what we were doing. And actually they, they listened to us, they were excited by what we were doing and thought, well, we're not gonna make big institutional money out of this, but we'll introduce you to some of our friends. And we went down and presented down in uh, uh, a club in London to a bunch of people who I didn't know who they really were at the time, and we just told our, our story with any kind of energy and a passion as to what we were doing. Um, what I didn't realize is it was a former chairman of the London Stock Exchange, the head of the Man Investment Group, which is one of the largest head funds, uh, several corporate finance lawyers, several different CEOs, several people involved in various technology banks, and 99% of the people in the room that day put money, albeit small amounts, into our business, and that was our first seed round. And one of the things that really made a difference in our business, and there's pros and cons to this, is we suddenly had a lot of very influential people having a vested interest in us being successful. And that can work really well in some cases. It can provide really useful introductions. It can also result in a few people hyping you up a little bit or other stuff to, to, to help them with some of the stuff that they were doing in their, their own career. I want to talk now, though, a little bit about the broader social political context that was going on at this point in time. So after 18 years of uh, Tory government rule, in 97, Tony Blair, pictured here, uh, came to power. This was on a bit of a wave as well where, you know, uh, you know Britain was, you know, whether it was music, various other things, we were really leading the, uh, leading the world. And a lot of politicians, there was an election coming up before too long, I think another year or two afterwards, and a lot of the politicians were wanting to get out of London and be seen in the provinces. And technology, the polit politicians may not have understood technology. You can see Tony Blair touch typing very slowly here. Um, uh, they may not have understood the technology, but they wanted to be seen and be part of that. And it, we were a 20-person company by this point, uh, somewhat over-inflated fish in the smallest pond in Cambridge, so the people kind of came to Cambridge and then they went to the St. John's Innovation Centre and then they looked for interesting companies. And in a couple of years, we had Paddy Ashdown, Tony Blair, the King of Jordan, Prince Andrew, many other people come in and visit us at various points in time. Uh, and it was a kind of exciting time in many ways. I'm gonna tell a quick story here though about this photo. So I remember this well when Tony Blair came to visit us. And it was really like, how do we demonstrate our software in a way that's friendly to kind of like Sky News and a quick soundbite in a way that you know, Tony Blair or other people will understand. And at that point in time, both Interflora and Teleflorist, the two largest UK online florists, were using our software. So we'll do a nice human interest story. We'll have, uh, I had an idea for the spin doctor, so we'll just get Tony Blair to send some flowers to somebody. The spin doctors loved it. And I've never seen the way that Tony Blair's spin doctors were. Uh, it was like, yes, great. If a WPC gets stabbed the day before, we can send, literally, quick word for word, we can send them some flowers into the hospital bed, and there'll be a great story in the news and to do it. And seeing the way their minds worked, it was, it was, uh, it was fascinating. And as a backup option, we'll send some flowers to Sherry Blair, and it will all be fine. So we got it all planned. The next day, it was like kind of this kind of like, uh, Tony Blair arrives, all a bit of a blur. We didn't realize that Tony Blair couldn't type. I mean, you can see the touch typing here. He couldn't use a mouse. Now, who, and now you may have taught your parents to use a mouse, and you kind of put your hand on their hand and try and do it, but it's not necessarily the right way to do it with the prime minister of the, your country with a camera in your mouth. Fortunately, it was not me. I would have not had the patience. Owen here, fellow St. John's computer scientist, actually, uh, was very patiently trying to show Tony Blair here where each key on the keyboard was as we did this. We didn't trust the internet these days. Tony Blair had a custom credit card created just for this event, just because he wouldn't, wouldn't, so his, his people would not trust the internet with his credit card. 
And we did all this. We got it all done. And Tony left, 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 left in the cameras. I was like, oh, and breathe. And then Angie Hunter, who was Tony Blair's uh, special assistant, came up to me a bit panicked and said, sugar, um, I was not sugar, but I'll say sugar, um, just had Sherry Blair on the phone. Like, Tony just sent some flowers to her at her work address. Now, Sherry Blair, if you didn't know, was a far more successful pre Tony Blair being Prime Minister. She's a very, very successful barrister, and she didn't like any government stuff touching her, her work account. And she really didn't like the fact that Tony had just sent her, or, well, so sent a text, but I put it in a text. Someone had called Sherry to say, I need you to be, there's some flowers coming to you tomorrow at some point in time. And I suddenly got asked to phone up Interflora and say, can you change these flowers to be delivered to 10 Downing Street instead at exactly quarter past three, because Sherry Blair's going to pop home and uh, uh, pick them up, and she'll be there before she has to rush back to another meeting. So I pick up her phone and actually try and get through to somebody at uh, uh, Interflora. I bet my Interflora's a bit of a franchise, and say, hi, Tony Blair has just placed an order for some flowers for Sherry Blair, and you need to try and move them to 10 Downing Street. Now, like Ross Anderson, you're a security person. The people go, who are you? The people like, there's a whole lot of authentication things in this communication. Like, like, who am I? Who is this strange person? What's more, it's the way that people like Interflora worked at that point in time is they didn't have the order yet. What they had was once a day, or someone would fax them through their web orders from their web company to them, and they'd then process them like a manual order that they'd actually done, and that's the way that it worked. And, I, and they actually hung up on me thinking I was a random, like, you know, uh, hoaxer. So I called up again and said, look, you've got two choices. You either believe me or you don't. And if you, worst, if you don't, and if I'm lying, you're only going to waste a 20 pound set of flowers. And you'll know when the order comes to it, it's there and it'll be on Sky News tonight. Just send the flowers to 10 Downing Street at this time. It worked. Whoa. They believe me. I found, I had to license this, I had to pay 10 pound to license this photo. But these are the exact flowers that were delivered two days later. And Sherry Blair's pretty smiling and thinking, I've come home from my meeting, uh, which is my busy day, to come and receive these flowers uh, before I rush back. But uh, uh, it was a kind of example of many of the fun things that happened during that time. And we were getting more successful. And I'm going to come back to our good friends Netscape and good friends Sun Microsystems. So in November 1998, uh, uh, Sun Microsystems bought Netscape for $4.2 billion. And like billion dollars these days always sounds so small because, you know, you know financial crises and hyped up valuation. $4.2 billion was a lot of money these days. At this point, all these server vendors, like right, all, all computer systems, all servers were being sold by uh, proprietary Unix vendors. And they were really worried that Netscape that really kind of was the dominant player in, the, in internet server software was owned by Sun, that they might get shut out. And we've been working with Hewlett Packard since we were students. I think Damien's email back in 95 was when we first had a response from someone at Hewlett Packard. And they kind of go, well, we, well there's a company, in, there's an English company that we had to buy and have some conversations. And we entered some serious conversations. I'm probably breaking slightly some NDAs, but it's a long time ago now. We had some serious conversations here with Hewlett Packard to go and buy us out at that point in time. And we flew out to Palo Alto. Uh, flew out one of our early investors to be kind of our financial advisor in some of this as well a little bit. Um, and we decided not to sell out to them. We honestly thought at that point in time that we actually were more exciting what we can be doing. Uh, at this point in time, I own 42.5% of the company. Uh, I, and my, my le let's just say, my lesson for this is when you first get your chance to take your first $10 million plus exit, take it. Um, you know, you live and learn. But crazy times continued into 2000. So the dot-com boom was in full flight. Here, on the top right, is the NASDAQ Composite Index from 1998 to through 2002. It goes up and then down afterwards, but we were kind of in this upward, very vertical bit before the, the, the downward came afterwards. At this point in time, about 5% of the world's websites were using our software. And Red Herring, which was kind of like the, the tech crunch or the business inside, if you like, of the day, uh, or, you know, you know, Stetis is one of the top 100 companies in the world. We had VCs, and this is why we turned down Hewlett Packard, like we had VCs fighting for a piece of the action. At one point, on one single term sheet, we had Soros, perhaps the biggest financial name in the world, 
Casanova, classic English bank with their private equity arm. UBS, a very large bank. Sumitomo, a very large Japanese trading company. And Intel, all competing to try and invest on the same term sheet, wanting to put more money in than we actually wanted to take. Um, it nearly fell apart because Intel actually pulled out, and then everyone thought, why is Intel pulling out? But we still managed to raise over 20 million at that point. And it was really then about how quickly can we grow. Our, our, it was all like, how quickly could we scale up? And we grew our company from 18 to 100 people over an 18 month period from about mid 99 to the end of 2000. At this point in time, press speculation, again, it didn't help some of the influential investors we had that were trying to raise funds themselves to do other stuff and, uh, uh, and knowing various financial journalists. But with this press speculation valuing our company at you know, many hundreds of millions of pounds and uh, I was still in 24 at this point managing the company through these somewhat crazy times. And then 2001 became a bit of a roller coaster. So the internet market was, had some cracks by late 2000s. And there's many examples I can cite from this period of time, and some of you will know this well, some of you less so. Like, I'll cite the example of Pets.com, which went public uh, in February 2000, having raised $80 million, only to file for bankruptcy by November of that year, having burnt through all of that money and having almost no revenue to show for it. And these were companies on the public markets, not private. And we thought that uh, we were the genuine technology company. We weren't, and there were some frothy internet companies out there. We were the ones making the picks and the shovels and, you know, with real technology stuff and real revenues and stuff. But the problem is, is some of our customers were going bankrupt and we had large stuff there. And it wasn't just the, the, the dot-com businesses that we expected a little bit because some of those were fluffy and overinflated. But it was the telcos uh, that then started to crack in 2001. And... Like, I remember one time we had a $5 million deal with a, a company called Globix, who were a big American hosting and uh, ISP company. And the CFO phoned me up and said, you know that deal we signed a few months ago? Well, uh, we're about to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. I can't pay you any money on this. I'm not allowed to legally. And you are behind $500 million with the bondholders in the kind of rights to any of the money for the deal that we signed. And so we not only were losing new customers, the deals that we'd actually signed, we suddenly had some very big customers potentially defaulting on. Um, this is also 2001, September this year, events of September the 11th, uh, further shut down some of the financial markets. And I remember, I sometimes have a dark sense of humor in difficult times. I remember Brian Amesbury, who was really kind of first extra employee coming back from reception once with a big like, legal looking letter. And I said, oh God, who's suing us now? opens it up, and it's a letter from Wilson Sonsini, who are one of the big lawyers, big American tech lawyers. And there, lo and behold, it was uh, on our, our core, one of our core products. It was a suing us for patent infringement and giving us a cease and desist immediately to do it. And we could probably fob them off a little bit or work around it, but the last thing you want when you're trying to raise new money in a slightly distressed distress situation is being, being sued for, 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 for patent infringement. And during 2001, we shrunk from about 120 to 50 people. And it is really difficult uh, laying off people from a company that you had uh, founded and grown and people who are your friends and others. Um, and the other challenge about all this is like, looking back on this, like we wanted, and like myself and others, we wanted to try and change the trajectory the company was on. But the investors themselves actually, were actually didn't allow us to. And it's quite rational as to why they were trying to do this in a way. Because they were saying, like, well, but you don't need to just raise money on this uh, at this valuation, we're still trying to get you public at some point. If you suddenly change all your forecasts and change the, uh, and there was, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, the challenge we faced. And we nearly died so many times in 2001. And to give you a specific example, at one point when our two investors, our two largest investors had competing but very different term sheets to us, and the company would not accept one of them, it would the other, but the, the VCs wouldn't agree to the other one. We basically just gave them a point and said that the postman is going to turn up at around four o'clock today, the letters are in the envelopes with a, to, to shareholders to wind up the business. And if the postman gets here before you've actually agreed with winding up the company. Fortunately, the postman didn't arrive early that day and one of the venture capitalists capitulated and actually uh, said, okay, we will, it realized it was better for us to still be in business and raise money at a lower valuation than help them raise our second fund, which is why their motivation was against trying to have some artificially inflated valuation. But it was a rocky, rocky times. And eventually, we, we raised the money. 
um, save the company, save the jobs. And I'd fought a pretty aggressive battle with some of the venture capitalists to do this, and it was, you know, my, my political capital was, was spent a little bit within this. And I was tired. I still believed the company would have a future. I spent some time doing a whole lot of product strategies, and I, I wrote a data sheet for a product called, we called it ZX was the code name that actually became the product that uh, later kind of set, created the application developer controller market that then resulted in Zeus getting acquired later. But it was, it was gonna be another long slog, and I was, it's a bit of a cliche, I was snowboarding up a mountain and decided I'd had enough, and it was gonna be time to, to move on and do something different. So you still got a happy ending. Uh, several years later, so I left in 2002. Nine years later, in 2011, it was bought for, uh, acquired for $140 million uh, by an American company called Riverbed. My shareholding had been diluted through various down rounds to uh, less than 1% of that, but nevertheless, 1% of $140 million is not to be sniffed at. But again, it's never quite so simple, and nothing with Zeus was ever easy. Um, most of this is public record now because it's in, in uh, uh, legal, document, legal case documents, but it's uh, the deal between Zeus and Riverbed had an amount of, uh, it was 110 million plus a 30 million amount based upon Zeus, the, the acquired business hitting certain revenue targets. The uh, first, Riverbed refused to pay those. Uh, Zeus took them to court. Riverbed class action lawsuit against them. Uh, we won. We claimed they hit it, then there was an actual, we got the money, there was then an appeal, and their justification was, we hit all your targets, but 20 million of this was actually from a, not from the software, but from a, a licensing deal you did for the source code to the software, and that that therefore doesn't count towards a target because it was not one of the, the products in the appendix that you actually had, it was a source code for the products that was different. Uh, this kind of went through various things, various legal disputes, and it was a further nine years, it was not until 2020, this finally got settled. Uh, and I, I got a little bit screwed by this because I'd actually taken some money, paid a lot of tax to it onto Her Majesty's uh, Customs and Exit, or uh, HMRC, only to then have to refund it post-Brexit when the pound dollar rate had also changed an awful lot. Um, a little bit of story about Zeus. Brocade purchased this business from, from Riverbed and then, put, and then sold it off to Pulse Secure, which was then acquired by Avanti. And the product that I can see before I left in 2002 is still being sold by Avanti today. So it's used for me was um, a great education, a lot of fun. Um, but it's also a little bit of a, a roller coaster along the way. And it's something that I, I think was very formative for me. I learned an awful lot. But then it's about figuring about, like, what do I do next? I want to quickly just talk about um, uh, uh, the kind of what I learned a little bit here about venture capital. VC can be really, really useful. Uh, it can give you capital you need for your business. It can enable you to scale faster, get to market quicker, and accelerate your business growth. However, an investor is for life and not just for Christmas. Investors are very rational, very logical about how they personally make money. I kind of shared a little bit of a story about how one of our investors was trying to raise a second fund. We were the biggest, most successful company in it. The round that we needed to save the business would have devalued us and basically probably hampered their chance to raise a new fund. You know, there can be different politics, different alignment about this in various ways. The other thing I'll share with you all is that any of you who study businesses at all, most VCs work on the model that if you maybe create 10 deals in a fund, of which maybe three they'll lose everything on, three they'll get their money back, and four they'll make 5x or 10x their money. The problem is when they make 5x or 10x their money is if you've got any down rounds along the way, the founders often end up being significantly diluted down in that process, as I say with this case of use. So there's cases where this is still a very logical decision to take, but remember with venture capital, there's probably about an 80% chance that as founders, you'll see nothing out of the business. So what next? What do I do? At that time, I hadn't made any money out of use. I learned a huge amount. Only ever worked for a company that set up myself. What do I do? Set up, so I set up a new company with uh, two colleagues that left use with me at the same time. Uh, we earned some money doing some consulting work. We also did some stuff. Uh, where we built the first ever comic relief online donation stuff. Before then, it was all done by telephones and people in BT Tower answering the telephone and doing credit card stuff over the phone. They decided it would be much better to try and do this online. And I remember Lenny Henry, uh, so the person that built this for us and was working with us, uh, he said to us, well, remember when Lenny Henry comes on TV and says, 
you know, for £10, we can give a child in Africa clean water and save a life and do this. This group, we're going to make $20 million or £20 million to donations to the website. We get one shot at this. Every £10 we lose to donations is going to kill a child in Africa. So make sure it doesn't go down. And this was the first time I really suddenly thought about reliability really matters. You know, reliability can be a matter of, of quite literally life and death in some cases. And during this point in time, though, I always believe chance encounters change things an awful lot. And we were doing a consulting project building a mail system for Telewest, who are now part of Virgin Media. And there was a chance conversation in a lift with somebody who was looking a bit stressed and distracted. So what's going on? So well, we just spent lots of money building new, uh, effectively, the kind of uh, the tail end of the cable network, the, the last mile of the cable network, and we just uh, rolled out a whole lot more infrastructure. And immediately, it's all just been consumed by this peer-to-peer -peer traffic that's hitting our network. And this kind of led to the birth of my, my second company, uh, my second kind of product company. Now, this is this graph at the top right here. This is, roughly speaking, this is our own research so, uh, that we did, but we looked at the amount of traffic that was being used by different protocols over time. And the blue one is the web traffic. This is a percentage of traffic. And the green is peer-to-peer is -peer traffic. And at this point in time, peer-to-peer -peer traffic was overtaking web traffic. Um, so this is things like BitTorrent, eDonkey, Kazar, and the other stuff that's around at that time. And uh, we thought, well, people are all downloading roughly the same stuff. Uh, you know, Damien's second year, uh, final year project was a web proxy cache. We know a little bit about this. How, like, how do these peer-to-peer -peer protocols actually kind of work and what it is? And so we started playing around with an experimental peer-to-peer -peer, peer cache to do this. Um, uh, we did our first customer trials of this right here in Cambridge on Virgin Media's network. If any of you were using the network around that time, about 2 o'clock in the morning one time, I did cause about an hour outage. I'm sorry. Um, we raised venture capital for this business, having once promised myself I would never do that again. Um, sold off our consulting business and a management buyout. And we decided to sell this rather than a pure software business. We saw this as a hardware company, so we sold big caches. This is a photo of one of them. And we made a few million dollars of sales when we'd grown to about 40 people. We had some challenges of scaling, though. So one of the problems that we had is there was a big bunch of different peer-to-peer -peer protocols. So we're all, they were like greedy things. There was no break in the system. So these protocols would actually lead uh, if people are downloading movies, a lot of them illegally, but they were like downloading movies and they would basically, the downstream of uh, broadband connections often faster than the upstream. So they would just go as fast as the amount of upstream bandwidth that was available in many cases. And actually, if you actually save any of that bandwidth uh, through, through caching, then any cache misses or other protocols that you can't cache yet would just accelerate and we're consuming some of that bandwidth. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer protocols, some of them are becoming more encrypted or difficult for us to intercept transparently. And there was also the kind of challenge that the majority of this stuff was actually copyrighted material that people were using over things like BitTorrent. And some of the telcos were slightly reluctant to invest lots of money in, in stuff that was basically being used by their customers for illegal downloads. Um, but at the same time, we saw three things going on. Consumers had a healthy appetite for online video and getting the latest videos. And this is before the days of Netflix or similar stuff. Secondly, content owners, though, at the time, like Netflix themselves existed as a, a physical poster DVD to people business. Um, but they felt there was no the network economics of the internet didn't make sense. It was too expensive. Yet at the same time, sites like the Pirate Bay were using peer-to-peer -to -peer to, so that people could download stuff for free. And this got us thinking, well, actually, why can't we actually become a uh, use our peer-to-peer -peer technology, a lot of our caches, and actually help to do a peer-to-peer -peer content delivery network? And we, um, we, we kind of a big pivot of the company. Uh, we had some really big uh, customer engagements, like the Best Buy and others doing video delivery services. Uh, raised a big chunk of VC. We brought in some professional management, uh, a, a big CEO from Salesforce. And it was all going great. But it didn't quite work out. Um, what happened here is like, we were going through this big pivot, and this new market was fairly a new one. And some of the, particularly the new CEO who came in, was actually just thinking, why can't we just push ahead and be very aggressive with some of these things? When the market wasn't quite ready, our product wasn't quite ready in, in our eyes in terms of, you know, we were moving a product that did one thing to try and make it do another thing. And there was a slight difference of strategic direction in some of this. And one, of our fa one founder left. And then in 2008, Brian and myself, we got kicked out of the company. The CEO said it's them or, or me and the VCs decided to go with the CEO that they had put in place. 
And then a few months later, that CEO himself then quit the business and decided maybe he wasn't right all along. Um, there's a moderately happy ending here. So in July uh, the next year, um, Alcatel Lucent bought Velocix for uh, a moderate sum of money. Um, uh, the business here got acquired in by no Nokia acquired ALU. Um, then Velocity spun out of that, and Velocity still employs about 200 people around the world. The headquarters are just up the road in, in, in Water Beach. And there's a quote here from Sir Winston. Um, I'm in Churchill College. How could we not quote, find a quote from Winston Churchill? Um, Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. And it was, it was a difficult time for me personally. Like, I'd actually just bought a house at the same time as they got kicked out. Uh, various things going on. And it's then figuring out, so, so what next? So Brian, the founder that got kicked out with me and I, we set up a consulting business, recognized the pattern. We tinkered around with some stuff, uh, looked around as to things that we could do. And we had a, a, a customer, a reseller for, uh, for Velocix in, out in Asia, uh, um, and they were wanted us to try and build a, a next generation HTTP cache. One of the challenges is about the way that the, the web kind of relied on the fact in the early days that everything has a unique URL, and that URL to find the content. But these days, the internet had moved to using HTTP for trunking video through protocols like Dash that uh, break up HTTP, like YouTube is now almost all HTTP video chunks in various ways, or various other people using HTTP in a way that is not cacheable in the right way. And so we built some, some caching software for them, and the Asian economics are totally different. The difference between uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur and Singapore is about the same as London to Amsterdam. The ping time, though, can be about 500 times as big because not the speed of light is slower in Asia. It just might end up getting routed via Tokyo or other stuff because there is not the same, certainly not back then, there was not the same interconnection of stuff. And so we ended up building uh, some caching software. We originally just built this for them to sell. We then set up a joint venture with them. And uh, we were pretty successful with this, actually. We licensed this to Alcatel Lucent, our good friends there, Huawei and others. Um, achieved, uh, I can't even talk about the numbers, but it was into the high tens of millions of dollars of sales uh, and selling to ISPs throughout Southeast Asia. Um, we also then kind of got into the adding the content delivery aspect to this as well. Um, uh, we, we realized that content delivery in Asia is particularly difficult. The telcos in places like Indonesia, they are pretty much monopolies. They can control it. They won't let people like Netflix or TikTok or others into their infrastructure without being able to monetize some of this. So we built this kind of Asia-centric content delivery network where we would enable the ISP to actually make some money out of that. Um, and right now, actually, things like TikTok or others in certain countries are still uh, being delivered over the, the network that we built there. Um, what happens here, though, is like, Asia's a funny place to do business. And around 2015, the, the CEO was wanting to try and take the company public. Um, I was not less confident about the quality of some of our long-term revenues and whether we were right and had the right governance and other stuff to properly be a public company. And I just didn't want to commit to this for a two or three year thing as an officer of a public company in Asia. And I negotiated the seller some of my shares and decided to step away. Um, Swiss have never made it to IPO, but it's, it's still going rebranded under its parent company name. At this point, I stepped back and then I thought, well, what do I do now? Do I just step in another consulting business? Do I just find a new startup? What do I do? And I fancied actually a change. All of my career, I've been doing stuff for businesses that I had founded, uh, somewhat constrained by the amount of the scale that a startup could operate at. And I kind of fancied a little bit of you know, doing something big, learning from something at real scale. It was kind of like a go big or go home mentality a little bit for me. And serendipity, again, like, you know, like a Google recruiter called and said, uh, would you like to come and work in Google in this SRE role? And I said, well, what's SRE? And tell me a little bit more about this. And I was curious, uh, went along for an interview. They offered me an a role in, in Ireland. Uh, I thought it'd be curious enough to find out a bit about it all, but decided I didn't want to move to Ireland. And uh, they then offered me a role in New York, and it was still a bit further away than I wanted to be. So eventually they said, well, we haven't really got a role for you in London, but we'll make one for you if you'll say yes. So I ended up... Uh, going to go and work for the, the Borg and, uh, at Google. Um, Google was a bit of a culture shock for me in several ways. It was a technology stack that was completely different to anywhere else. 
I mean, it's almost just been developed as a parallel universe where all the open source software that you see in the outside world is largely based upon papers that Google had written five years ago uh, or stuff we developed five years beforehand and maybe published a paper about two years beforehand. And it's like in Google, you never need to scale down. It's always how you scale kind of to the great level. And I've gone from a startup of, you know, typically businesses less than 100 people to a company that I think it was 60,000 when I joined. It's 200,000 today. And the scale of Google blows my mind every day. I mean, we have nine different products with a billion plus monthly active users. Uh, Google's revenue in 2022 was $282 billion. It's like $11,000, $12,000 a second. Uh, we have billions of queries a second coming in externally, many, many more in our kind of what we call our east-west traffic behind that. And we have, I can't give the exact numbers, but we've got millions of, of servers behind our infrastructure. And like Google's kind of got this big mission, and it's kind of the scale where it can actually carry through on these things to kind of organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. Critically, though, what defines Google is not necessarily its products. Anybody can build a site like YouTube. You know, any self-respecting student hacker can think, well, you know, FFmpeg, build this together, website. How hard can it be to build a site like that? The challenge, though, is making it really work at scale when you've got billions of users all over the world giving high quality. And this is really what site reliability engineering is, what I do at Google. And it's how do you build engineer stuff to be fully scalable. I apologize now, I'm going to have to go to some fairly more corporate plan looking slides, just because when you're a trillion dollar market cap company, you have publishing controls. And I'm going to steal some slides that I gave at a talk at uh, CloudNext a little bit. So in terms of SRE at Google, like we employ about 450 SREs at Google looking after many, many different services. This is our building uh, at King's Cross. Can you guess which floor our network engineers sit on? Um, uh, um, and you know, we look after and, you know, many of these services that are, you know, if you just think about what Google does, it's not just Google search. It is things like maps. It is uh, used by FB Panther Taxi to the ambulances. It is the services that are used as cloud services by many, many big companies, uh, to things like Google Office and other stuff. And when we have an outage, it now hits the, the kind of Sky News or similar things. So reliability really matters to us. I particularly, so I've got two jobs. I'm the site lead, so I'm the, the kind of UK lead for uh, site reliability engineering in the UK. I also work in the, the ANS business, which is my day job. So ANS is really the, the money machine behind Google. You know, our ANS business right now, you take our last 10Q figure divided by the number of seconds in a year, it's about eight and a half, nine thousand dollars a second worth of business that we are, are doing. And keeping systems like that up, running, and working uh, are pretty challenging. At the same time, there's lots of bad actors out there. So there are many people who have click farms of trying to like, uh, you know, anything when you're connected to the outside world where you can have people who set up a website, and then have people, maybe people in, in Asia, clicking away as real human beings. We can detect mechanical clicks very easily, but when you actually get human beings with racks of little tablets and phones clicking away manually to click on ads that are be fraudulent, we need to make sure we are filtering those out. The scale that we work at here is it's difficult to, to ascertain until you realize the, the kind of billions of dollars that we spend on our own infrastructure, the, the number of servers involved here. And we're obviously very heavily interconnected. A lot of ad buying is like a stock exchange, which enables live buying, bidding, and other stuff. And so it's actually pretty complex in terms of understanding the systems and the logic. So in terms of what kind of SOE is and what I do right now, um, it is really, in my mind, about how you put a structured engineering philosophy around, reli around reliability and how you then enable really good business making, business decisions around risk, reliability, and other stuff. So like, how do you engineer failure into a system? Like, how do you cope if this data center gets blown up, if uh, we get cut because there's, I don't know, an explosion in the North Sea caused by somebody trying to blow up gas pipelines and they blow up some uh, undersea cables at the same time? How do you cope when uh, during the pandemic, everybody's working from home and the number of people using Google Meet is suddenly goes up, grows by about 50-fold in a matter of a few days. And this is really about like, how do we have these kind of plans in place, how do we scale, and how do we make sure that we keep the, the web going. Um, in terms of uh, 
a final slide here. I want to kind of just summarize. I wanted to try and make this a little bit educational. Uh, share some of the things that uh, I had found along the, the way in terms of stuff that uh, I had learned. Uh, and just to share with you the benefits of some of this. So in terms of starting a business, uh, the team really matters. You can't do it alone. There's too many ups and downs. There'll be too many moments where you'll think that you'll not succeed, or there'll be, there'll be great moments that you actually need people to, to share it with along the way. The idea is obviously a key thing, but you've got to like, understand the bottom, understand the pain points, like mess around with stuff, understand the, 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 the cool things that are out there, and test concepts early. But I think as well, you've got to be prepared. I told you the kind of hotmail thing earlier, just to say there's often many side things that you can get into that once you start uh, looking into things. Um, my mode of operandi was always to set up a consulting business first in vaguely the area that I was interested in, to actually find, to build that customer empathy, to find things that would be uh, a, a good way of potentially finding products and actually finding people that said, if I built this, would you buy it? It's a great way to get your first customers. I think you've got to be fearless. Right? Don't fear failure, obviously, but also don't be scared of big companies. It's really funny. There are so many people who go, I can't do this because Microsoft, Google, or somebody else will come along and kill that business. Google, Microsoft, big companies, they really struggle to innovate. Right? I can be careful what I say about my current employer. They're very nice people. They pay me lots of money. But most of their products have come from acquisitions. It is really hard to move the needle when you're doing $282 billion of revenue a year to have a new thing that is actually uh, investing in and is there. So don't be scared of those really big companies. I think you'll be prepared to like, understand that businesses involve. Like, I told you the story about Zeus and the 20 years or so it took to get an exit for that company. But many great companies, like Microsoft started off with financial software, Hewlett Packard started off with automatic urinal flushes, Nintendo made rice cookers. All very, very different. Like Xerox is another interesting one. They invented the UI, the mouse, the photocopier. They make most of their money selling black powder, i.e. the photocopier, uh, uh, kind of, not ink, but the dust, if you like. Um, toner. Uh, the other thing is don't overly index on engineering. We are all engineers probably here. Our common link is we're computer scientists. We get very excited about the algorithms and how pure our code is. Customers don't actually care too much about that. Customers worry about are you actually solving their problems. Right? Simple statement, right? but it's important to, to remember that. Um, one thing I did really well, um, looking back with the ZXTM or ZX products we called it that when we first designed it is we wrote the data sheet first. And actually think about what is your product you're really actually trying to offer before you get into trying to write lots of code. Another thing that I think matters is when you do incremental versions, it's actually write the release notes before you write the code. And it's not test-driven development, but release note-driven development. So you think, well, what are, the, what, what are we going to do in this release? And which of these things are going to excite our customers about what we're doing? As a startup, you've got to be focused. Um, you need deadlines. Like your students, you know this. You, know, you, know, you don't do anything until a week before the deadline, or at least I didn't. But you've got to keep that focus, and you've got to stop yourself getting too distracted. You've got to, you're a lot smaller. You're much more resource constrained. But at the same time, you've got to be open to ideas and serendipity and the chance opportunities that will come along and the side ideas that may be bigger. And with side conversations and these things, is these are like lottery tickets. You may not necessarily know which ones you can win, but you can alter how many you buy. The more, chance, the more conversations you have, the more you network with the right people, the more kind of cool technology you mess around with and pontificate with a little bit, the more you can actually uh, have a chance of winning that. In terms of scaling, um, one step at a time. Really focus on like, who is my first customer going to be and why would they buy from me when they're going to be my only customer or they'll know we're really small. Then how will I find the next 10 or the next, and then the next 100 beyond that? A really important concept that's populated, uh, popularized by, again, come back to Mark Andreessen, uh, was product market fit. Now, product market fit is when you've got a product that the market wants, and that they actually, at this point, the market is coming to you saying we want more of it, and you're ready to basically just ship it to them. And if you get to that point in time, the customer pull will just be enough to generate all the business for you in many ways. And, and if you before product market fit for put your effort into getting it, uh, and when you're there, know when you're actually there because it changes the way that you need to do, to do business. 
understand your, your sales funnel and why, why really be clear. Like one of my mentors at one point said to me is, who is your customer? Why are they buying it? And why wouldn't they buy it? Or why, if it was free, would they still not do the business with you? Really understand that value thing. Like, what are the competitive threats? What are the, you know, the kind of nobody lost their job for buying IBM kind of things that might actually mean it would be risky for them to come to you? Also, a, like, a mistake I made with Zeus is actually thinking at one point we could increase the number of uh, salespeople we had and we'd get more, uh, more revenue. Actually, without really understanding that most of our leads were actually inbound from viral marketing and success or other stuff here and word of mouth externally and not necessarily so increasing the salespeople when we did it the first time didn't really help us grow our revenues. Um, investors, team and culture are all super, super important. These are the people you bring along with you on your ride. Whoever those people are, you need people that are there who will see you through thick and thin. Right? Your founders, you know, the, I've been very, very fortunate with the people I founded businesses with. They've been good friends, people who I know would have my back, and we could work together through things. We could come through disagreements. We could come through good and bad times together. Similarly, bringing in senior managers or other people, your investors, spoke a lot about those already, is the decisions you take here are critical to your business. It's far more important to get the right investors at a bad, the right, great investors at an okay valuation than to get okay investors at a great valuation. And growing that culture and scaling it, when you're small enough, when you're five or six people and you're all in one room and you all know each other, it kind of happens very naturally. When you get to 40 to 50 people, like when it's used, when we scale from 12 to 18 to 120 people in 18 months, you'll be very, very deliberate about how you keep that culture, how you keep people motivated. And finally, like, it is important to keep grounded. Like, success often is, you know, there's a big part of, of chance of being in the right place at the right time. Um, enjoy the journey and not obsessing over the destination. I know people who have gone, like, into businesses and they've just obsessed over, I'm going to sell this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to, right? And it's a rocky, rocky path, and it's not easy. And, like, startups aren't for everyone. Like, you know... Places like Google or others can be actually a very attractive career path as well. I've kind of done a little bit of both. I've actually, you know, you know in terms of what I've learned, in terms of financially, I've actually done pretty well out of Google per day worked or per hour worked versus other things as well, and the opportunities are, are pretty exciting. And finally, like, never forget like, your, your health, family, and friends. Um, you know, I've had some, a, pretty, uh, a bit of a roller coaster career, some really highs and some really lows. I would like to think I've kept pretty grounded through most of that. Uh, and it's my friends and family that kept me there. There's times where I've maybe not done as much here as possible, but it, this is something that I think is, is super important. And so with that, I'm going to just hand it over to any questions you may have. Great, thanks, Adam. A fascinating journey you've had. Now, who would like to kick off with a question? Can we use the mic because we've got some remote audience as well? Yes, we have um, as many people watching remote as we have in the room. Uh, Adam, first of all, thanks so much. That was, that was fascinating, and I was particularly interested in your, your many references to culture. Um, I was actually an engineer here the year after you. Um, and my sister was, was your accountant. She was here the year before you. Um, that's another story. Um, now, the reason what question I wanted to ask was that um, I'm coming to the end of eight years as the organizational sidekick of a Cambridge tech company run by a Cambridge computer scientist founder and have observed um, the freedoms, the culture of small companies, and the sort of the wisdom, the perceived wisdom that people go from big companies to small but very rarely succeed going the other way, generally because of culture and bureaucracy. You've clearly thrived and succeeded, and um, obviously you can't share too much about the internal workings of Google, I gather that, but um, do you see many others at Google who've also thrived and succeeded going small to big in Google, or have your other contacts and your founder colleagues and friends in the wider community who've succeeded going small to big with other companies? It's a really good question. And I, when I went to Google, I had no idea if I was going to be able to. Like, I almost felt that I might be unemployable. Right? I, I had never 
been to an interview before in my life. I'd never worked for a company I'd never founded before. Uh, I quite enjoyed the kind of free thinking opportunity to be my own boss. Um, small, like, I think there's two different things in your question. Like the small to big and big to smaller are, are, are different. Like, I think Google was probably the one big company I could have probably, okay, one of a small number of big companies I could have worked for. I think I would have struggled to go and work for, for IBM or Hewlett Packard or, or uh, I might say Cisco at that point, just for Andy's benefit here. Um, because I think by that point in time, these were quite institutional, mechanical, big companies. The Google that I joined in 96 was still anarchic and a little bit crazy, engineer-led, which has pros and cons to it in various ways. And it was a big company. It was 60,000 people, I think, when I joined it. But it was still, uh, in many ways, like a startup-y type culture. And so it was, there were elements of it that were an overgrown startup. I think it's actually harder for the people who've only ever worked in someone like Google to suddenly go to a startup. Because you've got so much the tooling that you have, the resources that you've got, the lifestyle you're used to with everything kind of being handed on a plate to you quite literally. It's very, very different in a startup world. Um, like, I mean, I, I guess your question here is, like, okay, in terms of people, like, so actually what's interesting is Damien Reeves, my co-founder at Zeus, also went to Google uh, and is now at uh, Meta. Uh, and the person that uh, was my mentor when I did an internship at Madge Networks, I briefly mentioned, and was my VP of engineering at, uh, at Zeus and at Velocix, is also with me in SRE at, at Google now as well. So there's a, a small sample quite close to me of people that have been able to, to do that. And I think it's it actually helps having done some of that startup stuff in a way, going to a bigger company. I do know, though, there's some interesting external posts actually we look around by some people that were acquired by Google recently. There's been quite a bit of press around Google's culture a little bit if you look at a few things recently. And there was an observation, it's a Medium post by somebody who was acquired into Google through a startup. And he was both uh, in awe at the kind of the, the technology, the resources, and the scale of it all, but was also like looking around at these people are complaining because, oh, it's sushi in the, in the restaurants again for the third time this week. I think the example he used in a few things. And having come from a, a mean, lean startup that just got acquired here, it was a bit culturally different. So it is different, uh, particularly now the scale. I mean, the, the socioeconomic impact of these big companies has actually forced many of them to become, the big tech companies to be quite corporate in nature. Uh, you know, lawyers play almost as an important role in some of our product decisions and uh, as engineers do in some cases these days. Uh, and that, that changes the culture a little bit with it. And I, think, I, I think it would be a lot harder for me to leave the startup world and go to the Google of today than the Google that I joined in, in, in 2016. I guess, a, I, guess a, I guess a slightly similar question. Um, but if you look at your journey, do, do, and, and now, you're, now you're responsible for uh, a large part of the internet, do, do you sleep better at night now, uh, being in charge of a large part of the internet, or, or do you sleep better at night when you're worrying about keeping a company afloat? That's a really good question. Um, I think I sleep better now than I did beforehand. Like, I, I don't need to worry about can I pay people in next month at any point working for a company like Google that makes it easier. And that we've actually, in terms of keeping the infrastructure up and going, then we have actually have some really capable people. We don't rely on individual heroes. Though, heroes. We have a lot of uh, good, like ingrained in a lot of our practices now is where we need to be. There are still challenges, right? Like when the pandemic hit, you know, YouTube usage suddenly went to the roof, Google Classroom, Google Meet, like, these were some moments where people were scrambling around and said, like, we've told users for all the time that, you know, the cloud is always this kind of infinite supply of resources, and, you know, this is our opportunity to really show that we can do it. These were big scrambles for us at the same time that we had supply chain constraints. So, you know, there are scary moments a little bit, even at Google scale, and the significance of, you know, when something goes wrong with their systems, it can quickly add up to 
very, very large sums of money. But I think we've got a good philosophy around Google that we actually are pretty blameless about these things when they go wrong. We've, we've done enough preparation for most things that can do so, so that it's actually, even the teams that look after the most critical bits of underlying infrastructure, like our, our underlying network infrastructure, where when it goes wrong, half the internet goes down, uh, they're actually pretty calm in most of the time in terms of what they're doing. Thanks. I should mention from the point of view of people online that you can put questions in the Q&A and I'll glance at the laptop from time to time. Does anybody else in the room have a question? Matthew. So uh, uh, just to add another thanks for a really wonderful talk and sharing such an um, interesting uh, journey uh, with us um, and some of the lessons from it. Um, but just to pick up on a little bit on the theme from the previous question, um, but also uh, at risk at concentrating on one technical detail in the space of a, a much bigger story. Um, I just wanted to ask you uh, on the site reliability engineering front of how you give yourself confidence in the correctness of these systems. Um, when you're uh, operating at such scale, um, you, you can't test these systems by um, blowing up a transatlantic link, I, I imagine. And, and so how do you test that uh, you have faith that uh, your mechanisms will work in the face of failure? Well, that's a, a really good question. And there's many different layers of the technology stack here involved. So you've got everything from the underlying cables, the machines that we've got. And like when we operate, I think Gartner estimated four or five years ago, we had two and a half million servers in a public, num in a public document somewhere. We don't comment about it inside of Google, but it gives you an idea of the rough number. When you operate at that scale, you know, the things that are really rare events like solar flares causing random you know, memory errors or other stuff that you just can't test for it easily do become events that can hit you at scale. So in terms of how we test this, we do what we call uh, the disaster recovery and test uh, exercises where we do try and simulate various big failures. Some of these are just tabletop exercises. There are other times where we go, Nobody should be reliant on this single data center, so let's just see what happens if we unplug it for a few hours. And these are the kind of moments where we actually then go and say, well, if we do unplug, you know, pull the plug on this big fat building here, what, and it's a little bit harder now we have cloud customers or other people that may not take the same philosophy as what we do internally, but we, so with our own infrastructure, we can actually try and be in a position where we will take big chunks offline uh, and look at that. We also do lots of areas where we look at what we call kind of like graceful load shedding. So let's take something like with YouTube. Uh, there have been cases where uh, we will look at things like rather than, uh, you know, I think I can talk about this. In, the U in Ukraine recently, a lot of the infrastructure has been strained. Like we've been looking like, if, do we reduce the higher bit rates at the time of strained infrastructure so we're not competing with other people who may be at a having far more important things than YouTube videos there. And like, so that when we're failing, can we fail gracefully? Can we be looking at the, the, the right thing for us to be doing in various situations like that? Um, failure can often be pure technical failure. Failure can often come from internal business logic failures, customer interaction failures. We have systems that can sometimes go wrong because they're connected to other systems where people start bidding for certain things and things go uh, there, they can be malicious attackers. So we try and like look at the risk profile fairly accurately. We have encouraged a lot of internal scrutiny from our intern. You know, we've got very good security experts to uh, uh, lots of engineers in this space and have like a very open design review culture. And when we do release something, we release it very carefully through canaries, phase releases, and the ability to roll back uh, gracefully and effectively when it's there. And that's. But I'm looking at the systems level here rather than the pure software level, but at every level in the stack, we try and look for uh, defense in depth, uh, intellectual integrity over making sure we've got the right people reviewing code CLs, very, very large test infrastructure that, and the ability, we have this you know, ability to kind of test the entire code infrastructure, pretty much every commit that is made, and to make sure that we detect things as early as possible. So it is multifaceted and pretty complex, but we do a, 
we've learned over the years to be pretty good at it. More questions in the room? Please, sir. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for sharing all your experience with us. Uh, it has been tremendous to listen to. I have some experience myself, so I know what you're talking about. And I, I just thought I have a good um, suggestion for your next job. <laughs> I, if and when you get tired of Google, I think you would be an excellent external director on a number of fintech companies. Say nine, three of them will fold after a few years, three of them will do okay, and three of them will be great successes by your help. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for the, 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 the career advice, and maybe I'll chat further with you every dinner or something. I think there's a quick hand up back here as well. Another thanks for the insightful talk. Um, I'm actually interested in the uh, period of the dot com bubble fail, uh, uh, bursting. Um, do you think it would have been better for uh, for the company to not go through that cycle and not benefit from the uh, easy money flowing into it, but at the same time not experience the uh, failures of its customers? It's a really good question, and it's hard to get the counterfactuals to know what would have happened otherwise. Um, one data point I'll share with you is that uh, in like, I think it was May 2000, in May of 2000, we had investment bankers lined up to take us public. And there was another company called Orchestream who had the same investment bankers, the same auditors, and the same team from both of those companies taking, and they're another internet technology company. And they actually made it to the public market. So not quite your question, but they went a step further and we didn't at that point in time. And they weathered the kind of collapse of the NASDAQ as a public company, and we weathered it as a private company. There's, again, this is, so this was almost like a one level of the kind of counterfactual is what, what, what would happen there. They had a big cash pile that they'd raised the money with, but then had a share price that went down very quickly and very publicly, and employees that thought they'd made money but were locked in with the shares and some challenges. For us as a private company, there were some benefits of being in that position there. But your question is really like, what if we not raised the money itself like in 2000 and we were on a more modest growth thing, then I think with hindsight, we would have been better off. I mean, we were pretty, I mean, we were growing, but we were self-funded growth by that point, and were, like, we were accelerating our growth because the funding was available, uh, but we could have self-funded by that point. And if, with hindsight, it was self-funded from owning the first round of funding before, then I think we would have been significantly better off. But, like, it is very easy to look back on these things with with hindsight and assume what might have happened. Well, perhaps I might add um, one final question before we break for drinks. Uh, you've talked about the possibility of working for a startup as a founder, and the other alternative being to go and work for a corporation, whether it's a bank or Google or IBM or whatever. There's a third option, of course, which is going to work for a startup as an employee. And this is something that many students find attractive because if you're in the room with the 10 people who are the business, you learn about the whole business and it may be perhaps a useful apprenticeship for having a go yourself as a founder later. Um, you've worked for a number of startups and you've employed hundreds of young men and women as startup employees. Um, do you think this has helped them overall? Do you have any, any lessons that you can draw from that? Uh, that's it. Interesting question. Like, I look back on the people, particularly as youth in those early days, and whether it was a selection bias from the people uh, who were drawn to work with us, or the fact that, like, you know, or the experience, what we all experienced together, many of those people have actually now gone off and been really successful in what they've done afterwards. And I've often uh, kind of contemplated whether or not, exactly for your kind of your question is actually how much of that was actually them also seeing the journey, being involved with these things, being exposed to some of the challenges and the fairly broad, you know, it gave them a great learning opportunity in many ways. And 
So yeah, I think it can be a great opportunity in the right kind of environment. Uh, but I think it is, you know, with all of these things like startups, it is whether you're an, invest whether you're an investor or a, uh, a, a, an employee, it's very hard to pick the right ones, you know, if you're a student looking at them, other than looking for companies where the culture seems right, that you'd be a good fit for, and where you feel there is a, a potential for exciting growth. Great, thanks. Um, so, Adam, uh, I'd like to thank you again for coming and giving us this talk. It's been a, a, a great distinguished lecture. It's been great to hear from you. And um, let's thank Adam, and we can then go informal and go through to the bursary for drinks. Thank you.